Okay, so who am I? Well, um, I'm just like you. I'm, I work in a small business, or some of you have worked in large businesses, um, over 20 plus years of experience. Um, and I've uh, a number of titles to my name or chapters in other books. Um, I've worked for big and small firms, I'm currently working for an architect's practice as the head of IT. Um, we've not that many people, but we work for pension funds and finance houses. So we're, um, we're supplies to them, so we get attacked trying to get to BlackRock or Aviva or Standard Life. So we've had to up our security, so despite being a small business, we've had to punch above our weight. Um, so the first thing, when anyone I talk to who's a small business, they normally come back to me and say, well, why would cyber criminals target me? I haven't got anything of value. And that couldn't be far from the truth. Or couldn't be further from the truth. We all have computers, we all have processing power, bandwidth, and we also have bank accounts, contact lists, and all of that can be used for basically four things. That's all the criminals are interested in. Extortion, fraud, theft, or to reuse our assets for their own purposes. To commit extortion, fraud, or theft on someone else. It doesn't matter what the crime is, whether it's ransomware, whether it's a money transfer scam, or stealing credentials, it all boils down to extortion, fraud, or theft at the end of the day. And I find that's a good point when you're trying to talk to getting funding about what you're defending against. So if you keep it down to what the crime is, you're more likely to get funding. The first thing to do though is to actually take a step back and see what you have and actually reduce your exposure. So look at what you're posting online. What information are you giving away on social media that can be used to craft a targeted phishing attack against senior people in your firm? Yeah, elements of truth where you know, they have just come back from a conference, they have just stayed at a hotel which they've kindly posted. And so when the fake survey turns up, that click here, do this, you know, it seems plausible because there's an element of truth and they've given that away. Then there's your actual infrastructure. Are you still using Windows XP? If it's in the corner and it's online, it's a risk. There's automated systems that the criminals use that will in seconds find an exploit just by you visiting a website. The same with Vista. Are you using Java as well when you don't need to? Are you introducing security gaps and holes where you don't need to? You know, disable Flash if you find it still runs automatically. There's a lot you can do. Just take a step back and see what you have and get rid of the stuff that you know, well actually, I don't really need this. It doesn't really matter how expensive it was 10 years ago. You know, if you can get rid of it and you're safer for it, it will save you in the long run. Another one a lot of small businesses come up back with is, I've got no budget to speak of. Well, it's not just about the budget. There's three things you need to get right. There's the technology side, there's the people side, and the processes in place. Now, I've heard this a lot of times, but I'm not sure actually what that meant until I had to write it. And then I thought, well, the technology is the systems that we put in place. That's obvious. But the people, that's your employee awareness of what to do and what not to do. And the processes, well, that's also the guidelines and instructions you have in place for them. So if they have processes to follow, they know what to do. The same way you know what to do when a fire alarm goes off. And there's lots of companies that can help for free. Antivirus firm ESET has some free cyber training. Learninfosec.co.uk once again. Take five to stop fraud by the government and the police. I recently took out Hitchcock Cyber Insurance for a quarter of a million worth of cover. But it wasn't the cover I was interested in, it was the CyberClear Academy that they give you. The training is worth more than the premium. So there is things you can do without actually spending money, just spend wisely. Now, the seven areas that you need to cover to be protected. You know, you need your antivirus, but you also need patch management. 
Your email needs to be filtered, ideally before it gets to you. Your web traffic needs to be filtered. You need to make sure you control all the admin privileges on your network. And you need some type of access control. And lastly, in case all of that goes wrong, you need some good backups. Now, a problem we have is a lot of us come to these events and we end up blowing our entire budget on some super amazing bit of kit that does what it does brilliantly. But then we leave all the gaps everywhere else because we've blown the budget. So you need to make sure you are not blowing your budget unnecessarily, that you have something in place to cover the gaps. And it doesn't matter if you haven't got the best. The main thing is that you've got something somewhere, that you have each one of those seven areas, there's something. So with antivirus, why do we need it if it's built into Windows? You know, Microsoft's own quote there. You know, if you're running Windows 10, Windows 8.1, or Windows 8, you've already got Windows Defender built in. Windows Defender comes last in practically every known test. So there's a lot to choose for, additional requirements when you come to improving your desktop security. There's no right or wrong if it's what fits in your budget and there's lots of advice out there, but just don't rely on the free one that's built in. Now, there's also things you can do from larger firms that's free. This is some anti-ransomware additional software that's completely free for businesses. So if you don't have a budget, there's nothing wrong with using stuff like this. You know, because if it ever does its job, you'll be glad you've got it. It's a bit like insurance. You know, the risks of your house burning down are very, very slight. But if you ever need to use that insurance, you're glad you've got it. Patch management doesn't have to be expensive. My patch management is built into my antivirus solution. More and more people, more and more vendors are, are bundling things like patch management because they understand that it's no point having the best security in one side and then you've got loads of gaps because you're using out-of-date software. And the good thing about patch management, it doubles up as an IT audit of what all your users have. Some of that software may be stuff they're not meant to have. You know, they've installed dodgy versions, which in itself is a massive risk. Now, your security also depends on what version of Windows you're running. And believe it or not, four versions of Windows 10 are already unsupported. So Windows XP is unsupported since 2014. That's over four and a half years ago in April. Windows Vista went out in 2017. And then next year, just after Christmas, we have the major headache of Windows 7 going out of support. But just because you have Windows 10, if you've never updated it, there may not be any security updates. And you could be exposing yourself unnecessarily. Now, if you can't afford patch management or don't have the budget for it, you can take some tentative steps. Thycotic do a free endpoint application discovery tool. So you can run this on all your machines and see what you have and then make a list of what needs to be patched or removed. So once again, just because you don't have a budget, there's things you can do. Now, emails are still the main infection route for us. You know, I, I use a system called FuseMail that filters in the cloud before it gets to me. And every month, thousands of emails are rejected. They, they instantly know that they're bogus, they're not even going to attempt to put them in the spam. Then there's the spam. Then there's things they know are viruses. But I also block emails based on their file size. If they're absolutely tiny and have a URL hyperlink shortener like bit.ly, so there's no signature and it's just a bit.ly link, they're blocked. And I'm catching 150 to 200 emails a month that way, where some of the malicious emails are just that, that link and a bit of text. There's things like DMARC you can use. DMARC's free, technically. But to set it up can be a nightmare. 
a service like on DMARC is actually a tool that will help and that's actually free for small businesses as well but it only costs a few dollars a month to help get it set up but the thing with email remember an email can contain another email that can contain yet another email that can contain a zip file and so on the criminals can do all sorts of tricks to bypass your filters which is where education comes in so the criminals have a lot of options when it comes to emails you know, they can send you a bogus email through a number of tricks. You know, they can buy a look-alike domain. So, a, a domain you expect, but one of the letters is slightly wrong. The fact that there's international characters that look just like an O, but aren't, doesn't help. There's display name deception, where they say the, this is the name of the person, but the actual domain and that is different. And then they can just actually spoof your emails. Because believe it or not, email is not actually secure. But the worst one they can do, which causes the most headache, is to compromise the credentials of someone you work with or deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is what we've seen a lot of. So our supply chain, even our clients sometimes, they're being fished for their credentials and then they're sending us emails from their genuine email system but it'll have a fake Dropbox link it'll be a real signature but there'll be something in it that's not quite right and it's a case of educating people on what how they normally talk to you what collaboration systems they use if a client that never used Dropbox suddenly starts sending Dropbox when we've always used an enterprise grade system yeah you know, it should ring alarm bells knowing what how people regularly communicate and the systems they use and educating everyone can go a long way. Now, it's good practice to block uncommon file types because unless you're a web developer or a programmer, there is no need to ever be emailed any of these exotic file types. And the problem with all these file types is they can run a program. And even Microsoft and Google between them can't agree on a list of what to block. Gmail blocks one set of things as a default and Office 365 has another. So what I've done is I put the two together and made a bigger list. Also make sure you're blocking things like zip files with attachments. You know, there's no reason on a day-to-day -day basis for someone to send anyone a program. Now, after email, because a lot of emails go back out to the internet, so you need to block and filter all your traffic. And you can also filter all your HTTPS traffic with a service. You effectively put in a, it's called a benign man in the middle attack. It can cause a few headaches with some people's systems, but generally, knowing, giving all your traffic to a service they can then report back if anything tries to talk to somewhere they're not supposed to, like a command and control center for ransomware. Even your firewall, if you invest in a, a good firewall with unified threat management, it will block a ton of stuff for you, and it will tell you, and you can see where people go and what they're doing. A lot of these services also have free online checks. You can just visit the website and run the check, and. Yeah, they're geared up to try and sell you something, but they can give you a good indication of just how badly you, pro you are protected or how well you are protected. Now, you can filter your DNS for free. Quad 9, you just change the entries in your DNS to 9.9.9.9. .9 and it's licensed for business use and they will filter out a ton of your traffic for you, for free. If you're using OpenDNS, which is not licensed for business use, um, you're better off changing to Quad9, which is. It, you know, it, works, it works on anything. You can put it on your iPhone, you can put it on your Android phone, a tablet, anywhere where you can set the network addresses and have access to the DNS settings, you can just set it to 9.9.9. .9 .9. Now, admin rights is a security risk. And unfortunately for us, for the past 20 plus years, Microsoft has given every home user default admin rights on their machines. 
When it comes to a work environment though, that's something that needs to be changed. And by removing admin rights, if they can't install something, that means anything they click that tries to install something will also be challenged and prompted for, to give a, admin rights to allow them to do it. And it can be as simple as making everyone a standard user and add a new user on the machine that does have administrator rights. Or you can do what I've done and invest in a solution like CyberArk, which adds, as well as admin privileges, application whitelisting. So if it's not on the list, it doesn't get to run. And then none of my users have to worry about entering admin credentials because if CyberArk knows about it, it passes on the credentials. So they don't end up writing down on post-it notes your system admin, username and password. Now, Mike earlier mentioned the worst passwords of 2017. This is the top 50. If you see your password on any one of these lists, please change it immediately. Because the criminals use what's called credential stuff in bots. Once they find one of your passwords and an email address, they will check a ton of different services, Outlook.com, Hotmail, LinkedIn, that, and it will run in, in seconds, check a whole load of web services with your email address with the, these passwords and combinations of passwords. Same goes for your phones. If your PIN code is your year of birth, please change it. So how can you remember so many passwords? In fact, how many passwords do you think you have? I did a count, I've got 80. I took a, a list and I thought, let's see what the minimum someone could have. I still got to nearly 50. Because if you do any form of online shopping, if you live in the 21st century and have to deal with the council, the government, the bank, anything, you have a lot of passwords. And the password advice of do not write them down is flawed because we're not built that way. You are effectively saying to someone, pick a card, any card, memorize that card, memorize a password, and by the way, change it in three months. It doesn't work. So the best thing you can do is use a password manager. Pick a really good password, something that's not in a dictionary. In fact, don't think of a password, think of a passphrase. If it's not in a dictionary, someone can't look it up. It can be unrelated words, it can be gobbledygook, it can be like Mike said, it can be lyrics or a phrase you know and just the first characters. Just make sure it's something you can remember because I've dealt with my grandparents getting Alzheimer's and believe me, you want to be able to remember your passwords because if you fail to, you lose everything in today's digital world. And then as a business, you need to turn on two-factor authentication. Do it for your personal things as well. It's free on Amazon. It's free on LinkedIn. Turn it on because you've always got your smartphone with you. Someone tries to connect from another location, they need your phone. And same with the business context. If you're on Office 365, protect all your admins with two-factor. It's free. It's part of Microsoft Office 365 as your two-factor protection. It's Microsoft though, so they're only getting 90% right, so you normally need to pay someone else to get it right. So I'm currently looking at Secure Auth and Secure Envoy. It's a good thing to do is also go through all your emails, including your employees and colleagues, and enter them into Have I Been Pawned? This will tell you if they've appeared in a password breach. You can even say notify me and just enter the emails. You don't have to worry about checking on a regular basis. I'm caught in LinkedIn, Adobe, and two other breaches for sure. I was part of the Yahoo breach. I knew Yahoo had been breached two years before because I was getting emails to addresses that were only in my Yahoo account that didn't go anywhere. You know, I knew something had happened because my, me and another colleague both had similar emails and there was no way she'd been hacked. So check this, enter your addresses, it's completely free. If you find an email that's appeared in this, change the password and turn on two-factor. There's a load of emails going right now, around now saying that you've been infected, this is your current password for something, 
They've watched you watching porn. It's all a scam. They've just lifted off the passwords from a breach. Now, it's all well and good having all this protection in place, but you also need to spend some time and energy on working out what to do if you have a security incident. You know, it's a bit like putting lots of, lots of locks on your front door. But if someone does get in, you need to think about that. Now, there's a, there's a free checklist on process.street, a security incident response plan. You know, it's a good starting point. Also, have the equivalent of a first aid kit, you know, in the form of a USB drive with, you know, a copy of malware bytes, you know, a, a spare machine that you know you can use to get to no more ransom. And also, look at alternative forms of communication because if you're hacked and you can't use your main business email because you can't trust it, then look at things like Slack or River, ways that you can communicate that if you've been compromised, you know that won't be. But spend some time and have a think and talk to people about what they need to do. You know, if they've been infected, if they have a ransom demand, run through the scenario so it's not all panic. And the thing is, this doesn't actually have to cost that much to put in solutions to protect all those seven areas. It can come to as little as the cost of a latte a week per person. Three pounds. A lot of companies will blow that whining and dining clients. They'll blow that on jollies for staff. And they'll leave themselves unprotected. You know, you can put in place a, an antivirus and combined patch management. That's 30 pound a year. Email filtering with an archive, 33. Web filtering, 35. You know, a two-factor access control, 30 pound a year. It's all doable. But you've got to break it down to what it costs per person per month. And that way, when you go to get funding, you're not asking for scary figures. You say, look, you know, I need a pound a week for this. Or I need a two pound a month. It's not scary. It's a lot better than saying I need five grand or I need 6,000 pounds. Or... And also haggle with the vendors. You know, a lot of them offer three for two on subscriptions, three years for the price of two. That's a third off. You know, if it's a system you trust and you're happy with, negotiate with them. Thank you. You can find a lot more resources um, and links to my books and that, even my GDPR spreadsheet at boolean.co.uk, as in Boolean logic. I've also got a blog with 450 plus posts with lots more security advice and general free advice. Practically everything there is free or ultra low cost. Um, especially good if you have someone that has no budget and is a startup. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much.